Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, here in New York City, joined by, from long distance, of course, over Skype, by the founder, the owner, the head honcho, the grand poobah, the main man at Tournament Poker Edge. You know him, you love him. He's our favorite Twitch streamer, Killing Bird himself, Derek Tenbush. Derek, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Clayton. How you been, my friend? Good, good. How's everything down south? Things are hot uh, and sweaty. Um, although the, <laughs> I will expected. say the last two days have been uh, spectacular. It's just like absolutely perfect weather. But, uh, you know, as we've kind of talked about last time I was on, things are slowly opening back up. So we're getting out to all our favorite uh, watering holes and, re- you know, restaurants and stuff. So it's been it's been really good. Yeah. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking the time. I know you're running several businesses and you've got a lot – going on but you know it's become at this point i think it's fair to say a tradition that when the schedule for the world series of poker is released you and i go through it and kind of make our little wish list i mean i'm sure at this point you probably don't know exactly what dates you'll be out in vegas but i thought we should maybe go through the schedule and look at what's going on Obviously, things are different this year because normally we would have this conversation in February, <laughs> getting ready for the summer. But now <laughs> we're talking in the summer for what's going to happen in the fall. So uh, have you had a chance to look it over? I have, yeah. And it's it's funny because it took me several days before I even took a peek at it because it's just life was busy at the moment and I just hadn't had a chance to look at it. And then as soon as I opened it up, it was just kind of like... Uh, like a, a waterfall of memories and emotions came <laughs> over me. I was just like, all right, we're back. Yeah, it does feel good. I mean, now we did this last year, to be fair. We looked at the schedule. I remember being particularly excited about the mystery bounty event that they were going to have. And during that conversation, that was pre shutdown, but COVID was definitely a thing. And people like Mike McDonald and others were making bets on whether or not there would be. A WSOP, but you and I, in our eternal cockeyed optimism, we're just planning on playing all these tournaments, and we went through the whole schedule <laughs> together. I don't even know if you remember I do. February of 2020 when the original schedule was released, and then of course uh, all that all the wishing that we did that day ended up just being uh, just flushed down the toilet <laughs> by this uh, novel coronavirus, which, as you say does seem to be pretty well at hand. I mean, here in New York, the infection rate is like 0.3% for a place that used to be the epicenter, as they constantly called us in the media. The epicenter of the coronavirus is New York, New York. And uh, now there's like hardly any COVID going around. Comedy clubs are open. Things are happening. Obviously, Vegas is booming. I don't know if you've seen any of the news, but things are going wild in Vegas these days. Yeah, it's crazy. Like... uh it's still taking me a little while to honestly adjust like to seeing like full stadiums on sporting events and TV and um, yeah, video from, from Vegas or even some of the numbers just coming out of like the various poker series that are running, you know, whether it be Florida or Vegas or wherever. Um, Like you see pictures and you're like, Whoa, 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 those people are too close together. And then you're like, Oh wait, we can, we can do this again. This is great. (laughs) Yeah. Unmasked. Uh, with no plexiglass between us, six feet apart is no longer a problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it makes me happy. I'm sure it makes everyone happy. And that is reflected in the numbers these days. The uh, the, the latest Florida tournament was like record-breaking fields. I'm just crushing every possible guarantee. Uh, you know, when we spoke with uh, the groupie, uh, Elena Stover, uh I guess a couple months ago now, and she was talking about how excited she was to get out to Vegas this summer, even though the summer is is not World Series of Poker. All, all the other casinos are still doing basically their normal thing. Like there's a lot of big stuff going on at the, at the Win and at the Venetian, and just all the places that would normally be alternatives to the World Series of Poker right now are happening. They're not they're not competing with the WSOP, which they had to basically had to like reschedule for 
the fall because mm-hmm. of scheduling and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's been interesting because uh, you know, I've, I, like you, I'm sure I have a lot of friends who are out there grinding tournaments, and it seems like even some of the you know what I would call I guess third choice casinos for tournaments. You know, like usually it's the World Series, and if you're not playing there, it's like the Venetian or the Win. And then you got the stuff below that. Even the stuff below that is like crushing. It seems like like I'm seeing these big South Point guarantees. Yeah, uh, seeing Orleans. stuff at Orleans. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which I, I mean, me, me and Mark Galliotto called the Orleans our home last World Series because we just love going to that casino because it's just so trashy and great in like all the best ways. Uh, yeah, it's all smoky. And yeah. The, everyone there is a local and. <laughs> Yeah, it's there is something special about the the Orleans. I used to live not far from there. Uh, I I say live. I rented an apartment about uh, maybe like half a mile from the Orleans, uh. probably twelve years ago, and lived there for four months. It's really the only time in my comedy career that I ever took an extended break like that. I just didn't want to be in New York for the winter, so I basically spent four months uh, just playing poker. And I used to play at the Palms, which is currently closed because it got sold to, I don't remember which uh, Native American tribe or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, there used to be a great poker room at the Palms. And I used to play there almost every night. Wow. And when I wasn't there, I would go to the Orleans. So you now Vegas is constantly changing. But, yeah, back in the day, we would play at the Palms. Uh, Macaulay Culkin would walk in. Rosario Dawson would walk in. A lot of celebrities <laughs> used to hang out at the Palms. This is when the Palms had that deal with Playboy. So they they, they had a Playboy club of their own, and it was all like uh, kind of branded. So you got like a lot of these Hollywood type people turning the Palms into like you know the the Playboy Mansion East or right. whatever. So uh, it, it used to be very sceny. And then it was purchased by Station Casinos, which is not really their brand. <laughs> you know, Station Casinos are nice, but they're they're it's like Red Rock and places like that. They're not really uh, they don't know how to do like oh let's be the sexy glamorous uh, place that all the kids from L.A. come and party. Right. So they tried and failed miserably. They spent like a billion dollars on a renovation, and now they got now the whole pl- property got bought by a. a a Native American tribe. I forget which one, but they're 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 redoing the whole place again. So, who wow. knows? It just yeah. You know, I love the location of the Palms, and I love the vibe in there. And I used to really love playing poker there, but you know they haven't had a poker room in years. But yeah, that used to be my hangout. Nice. We play like one, three, two, five, no limit. Put the straddle on the button and go crazy. You know, <laughs> that was that was a good time. <laughs> Stack Macaulay Culkin a few times. Call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> No, he was smart, man. He's a decent player, and he would show up at like 3 a.m., completely showered, like really just fresh as a daisy. You could tell that he had taken like a disco nap and was going to come and try to fleece some tequila drinking tourists who yeah. had just you know, struck out at the nightclub or whatever, and were going to go play some poker to drown their sorrows. So he would be ready for them. Yeah, he, he very seldom if ever lost <laughs> because he just he was the only one that was like fresh and ready to play at three o'clock <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah live poker is fun it's really different so i'm excited to get back into it i'm actually heading to vegas myself um next month i'm gonna play the a uh, few events at the venetian sort toward, toward the tail end of their series and uh you know i, I got a couple of meetings and stuff that i'm doing out there so I'll get my taste, even though it won't be the World Series of Poker. I will be in Vegas for the summer, for a part of the summer anyway, and that's that's going to feel good. Yeah, that'll be great. It'll be nice. I actually um, I just recently got the schedule for the WSOP Circuit event in Cherokee, which actually happens in August, so it'll be before the start of the World Series. Um, and, of course, Cherokee's kind of my closest. If I have a home casino, I guess that's it, even though it's five hours away. Um, but yeah so they announced that schedule so it it unfortunately falls right i have a a business obligation right in the middle of it uh but that obligation is on the way to cherokee so i think i'm just going to go straight from there to cherokee and play a few events and uh and shake the rust off before you know before heading out for the big the big dance in in vegas yeah that'll be a good warm-up and that was one reason why i definitely took the opportunity to go to vegas next month because like you, I need to shake the rust off, man. I, I was I was really nervous about, uh, you know, just trying to to jump right in after. You know, basically, it's going to be almost two years since I will have played live poker when this World Series starts. 
and I know other guys and girls are out there doing it. So I wanted to make sure that I, you know, sat down, felt the chips, felt the cards, felt the felt, yeah, and you know, got back into the groove so that I'm not like a, you know, lost <laughs> like a fish out of water in, <laughs> in the fall when everything really is going to matter. So yeah, um, I'm pretty sure the last time I played a hand of live poker, other than recently with some friends in a basement, you know, our our buddy's basement. Um, would have been Super Bowl two Super Bowls ago, so you know the February I guess before COVID hit was the last time yeah. I played a hand of live poker. Um, so it's been a long time. I need to get back to actually like knowing how to count chips and stuff. It's gonna be weird. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 different from just clicking the buttons, but I'm here for it. I'm excited. I'm ready to do it. So uh, why don't we go through the schedule? Of course, the main event is going to be November fourth through November seventeenth. So the 17th would be the the final, final table. And I'm sure everyone knows by now, but it won't be on ESPN this year. It's actually moving to the CBS Sports Network, which has been doing a lot of poker uh, in the last several years. CBS Sports Network has been recently the home of Poker Night in America and some other uh, poker broadcasts. We also did some stuff, uh, a partnership with Poker Go. And the CBS app, which is now the Paramount app. Uh, but, yeah, we were doing some streaming on the CBS app a few summers ago. So the uh, groundwork had been laid for uh, this move to the CBS Sports Network. But, you know, make no mistake, there aren't as many viewers on CBS Sports as there are on ESPN. I mean, ESPN is still the gold standard for sports channels uh, on cable. But I'm hoping that these tournaments will end up being on the Paramount app, which is doing really well. On that app, you can get like all the CBS owned, the Viacom properties, like any show that's like ever been on MTV or Comedy <laughs> Central or C- or CBS or whatever. So uh, I, I resubscribed, or I should say, I subscribed to the Paramount app solely for the purpose of watching the Real World New York reunion, 30 year reunion. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Was, what was that like? It was terrible, but <laughs> but I was desperate. You know, I had I had, I had finished Netflix during the <laughs> pandemic, so I needed something. I went with that. It was pretty bad, but it was you know it was a nice walk down memory lane. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I remember the original Real World. Now they're all just like fifty years old and like totally reasonable. Like yeah. that's not. <laughs> uh... Those shows need young people. Like you can't have old people on those shows. You know, that's that's not what it's all about. We need, like, hot tempers and people who don't know about life yet. Exactly. Not, like, older, wiser, real world. That sounds horrible to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at the WSOP. What do you, what stands out to you? I know I mentioned a couple of the events last week, but uh, I promised the uh, listeners I'd try to get you on so we can do, like, a bit of a of a deep dive. Yeah. Like, if you could go for the whole fall. Well, what are your plans? Do you think you'll be out there at all? Yeah, uh, so I, as I was looking it over, um, I mean, in a perfect world, the sweet spot for, well, in a perfect world, I'd be there the entire time uh, yeah. as in the past. But I, I know that's not going to happen this year with everything going on with the distillery and other life obligations. So um, the, the the sweet spot for me would be in the middle of the schedule, like really starting with the millionaire maker um, and then yeah. kind of working through like the monster stack. Uh, and then there's a bunch of like, you know, uh, deep stack tournaments and six max tournaments all kind of mixed in there that like one K's and 1500s and stuff. That would be perfect. That's probably like, so that's, that's where my brain tells me I should go, but my heart tells me I should go later in the schedule when the tag team event is, because that's my favorite event. (laughs) Tag team events are so much fun. The, The first one I ever played, maybe the only one, I guess that I've ever played was actually in the Aussie millions out in Melbourne where uh, I was out there at the time, I was like sort of a quasi-sponsored pro for Cake Poker. Oh, <laughs> nice. probably, I would say most of our listeners have never heard of Cake Poker, <laughs> but it was a thing for a while. And um, kind of the head guy there was Lee Jones, who is just, if you don't know who Lee Jones is, like just a legendary uh, poker author and all around, you know, like, he worked for Poker Stars. Uh, you know, Lee Jones is like just kind of like, in a sense, the uh, the goat. And yeah. so, I uh, was hanging out with him. Uh, really, the first time I ever met him, 
and we ended up getting dinner and I was like, you know, there's this uh, tag team event tomorrow. Uh, why don't we play it together? It'll be fun. <laughs> and uh, he's like, you know, I don't really play No Limit Hold'em that much. I was like, no, it's okay. It's like $500, like whatever. like And $500 Australian dollars. So it wasn't like a big buy-in or anything. I just thought it would be fun. Yeah. And, you know, and we had like a cake poker blog all about it and stuff. We ended up doing pretty well. Um, and I remember that I, you know, we were tagging th the way that one worked. I don't remember how the World Series one works, but you have to switch every half hour, every level. So it's half hour levels. It's a one day turbo out there, uh, I see. and you, and you have to switch like every other level. So Lee Jones, uh, you know, he was playing like a super conservative, like you know, he was a limit hold him guy so he's used to like waiting for good hands like you know not trying to bluff anybody and then i get in there with my crazy style which if you think i'm crazy now i used to be like a really wild like <laughs> <laughs> like gus hansen circa 2005 wild and uh you know that was just my natural style like i really would like to uh put everybody to the test and try to win every pot and uh you know he said like just watching me play was giving him a heart attack I remember I ended up getting it in really good and getting rivered, and uh, all he said on the blog was, "You know, you guys know I don't tell bad beat stories, but let's just say Clayton was a big favorite, and that's how we lost." <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah, like that. But, they're yeah. such fun events. I, I the first time I ever did played it was with with Mark Galliotto and and Carlos Welch, and we just had an absolute blast. Dream team, look at that. That yeah. would be perfect. It was super fun. I was like. The, the one downside of it is that you have this weird sort of like, even though it is a cheap buy event, I think it was a 1K that year. So we basically all paid like $333 to play or yeah, something. So yeah, it was right. like, it was like going to play the daily deep stack or something. But you, it, there was this weird pressure. Like, I don't, I don't want to be the guy. You know, I don't want to be the one that busts <laughs> us out of this tournament. Especially because like me and Mark would lose chips and then we, that we'd tag Carlos in and we'd come back and he'd have like tripled us up and then we would just lose the chips again and then we'd tag Carlos in and do it all again. It was great. <laughs> so the Million Acre, Millionaire Maker event starts on Friday, October 8th and it looks like on the schedule I'm looking at, they only have two starting days this time, which is different from years past. I, if I remember correctly, the Millionaire Maker used to be three starting days. I think that's right, um, yeah. And then the tag team event I'm looking for so yeah you wouldn't be able to do both no yeah that would be towards the end like if you pressed me right now I think what I would say is that I would come out you know shortly before the tag team event and then basically play that and then all the other like um, no limit hold'em stuff throughout that because yeah. the good the bonus of that is that it would lead up to the main event and if things went well or I just decided I wanted to punt 10k or I wanted to sell some action or whatever then I could have that option of playing the main Whereas if I come out in the beginning and I know I can only do two weeks or whatever, then the main suddenly becomes not an option, you know. So I kind of like the idea of having that that sort of backdoor option to play the main. And there's a bunch of good stuff after the main event too. So even if it's just like, oh, I'll watch my buddies, you know, not really watch, but you know, sort of half rail with beers in hand, uh, my buddies in the main, and then I can play the little one, you know, little one for one drop and the crazy eights tournament, all that fun stuff. So. Uh, that's yeah, so kind the tag, of what I would lean. Yeah, no, absolutely. The tag team event is on Halloween, October thirty first. It's a, it's odd. There's a it's a two o'clock start for that one, and that on the same day, yeah, on the same day at ten a.m. is the Super Seniors event. So I guess you have to be super old. <laughs> <laughs> the Super Seniors event. But there's also the Colossus on that Saturday. So I I'm guessing you might come in. Play the Colossus, and if you make it to day two, then I guess you would have to skip the tag team event. Uh, yeah, or or just yeah. play it and then just like tag in for like my dinner break or something. Oh, that's true. Something like that. So yeah, tell tell everybody because I never played the uh, the tag team event at the WSOP. I only ever played that one in Australia, and we had to switch. So how does this work? Do, do you have to even play? Like if you're on a team, do you have to play? Yeah, as I recall, and it has been a couple years, but I'm pretty sure this is correct. You have to. Every player has to play at least an orbit, um, and you need to play an orbit before you can tag in and out. So it's not like you can sit down, play one hand, tag out, you know, get somebody else back in there. There is some sort of uh, limitations to it. But yeah, the only real requirement, in fact, I think there were a bunch of people like who went really deep or, or even maybe final tabled who had like some pretty big name guys on their team who played like an orbit. 
and that was it for the entire like three days or whatever because uh, they had other tournaments they were in like like i said like if you made day two of the colossus you just would want to fulfill that orbit requirement right. on your dinner break of day two of the colossus which is a 400 hundred dollar buy-in uh that usually attracts uh a very large field. <laughs> yeah, the other good thing about yeah that that sort of later schedule strategy is normally I would stay as far away from the Colossus as, as humanly possible, but <laughs> also it normally runs more towards the beginning of the series, um, which I guess they've kind of now sort of replaced with the reunion, you know, like that early low buy-in tournament. So I kind of yeah. feel like the reunion is now the one that I would avoid. Um, and I feel like the Colossus might not be quite as crazy. I, I definitely could be wrong about that. In fact, who even knows what the numbers are going to look like this year? I assume they'll be way up, uh, but who knows? It probably yeah. depends on what Bitcoin does. Yeah, I think uh, crypto is definitely – everyone's watching uh, the coins. You know, they're, they're so volatile. I mean, they always are, but lately they're extremely volatile, and I think a lot of poker players – have a lot of their net worth tied up in this one or that one, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. Um, I have a little bit myself, mostly because that's how I cash out when I <laughs> when I take money off the, the website. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the reunion that you mentioned, uh, I touched on it last week, but it's a $500 uh, buy-in with a $5 million guarantee. So that means even not even counting the rake, they're expecting 10,000 entries. That's yeah. a lot of entries for a, a five hundred dollar tournament at the beginning of October. The key is, unlike in past years, it's a little bit different. It might not be as much of a mob scene. Uh, you only get one entry per flight, one re-entry per flight. I oh, should okay. Say. I didn't so, notice whereas that. the Colossus, yeah. you could just keep buying in. We knew players that put in like twenty or thirty buy-ins, <laughs> wow. re-entries to the Colossus in years past. Because it is a turbo structure and it goes, you know, it goes fast and everything. Um, so you might just get it in on a coin flip, lose, go buy in again, do it again uh, until you you're not allowed to enter anymore. Uh, but this year they're trying to keep that under control. So even with controlling for each player only being able to, I mean, you can do multiple flights, but you get one re-entry per flight. Yeah. So that means, if my math is correct, a maximum of six entries at five hundred dollars a pop. So a total of three thousand wasted on the reunion <laughs> if you don't cash. So uh, so that might not be as crazy then. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit more manageable. I'm not really sure what the uh, the rationale was for that change, but for me it's a welcome change because uh, you know things just got a little out of hand with yeah, yeah. <laughs> with the Colossus, and it was always ten or sometimes eleven handed. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, uh, alternate lists and all that fun stuff. It, I mean, I think it's a great tournament that they're doing. I, I, I mean, I like the name. I, mean, I love the branding of it, the name of it. I think putting a big $5 million guarantee on it is great. Uh, it's just a great way to, like, welcome back the casual players and the pros, for that matter. Um, so I think it's really cool they threw that at the beginning. And uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to play it, but, <laughs> but I think it's yeah. great that they did it. <laughs> no, it's pretty smart. You know, they, they want us there at the beginning. They want to make sure that this thing kicks off really strong right at the beginning not everybody waiting until the main event at the end so they always try to stack a few enticing tournaments towards the beginning like you mentioned the millionaire maker which for those who don't know is a fifteen hundred dollar buy-in with uh, a guarantee of one million dollars for first place uh hence the name millionaire maker and that's october 9th so only like a week and a half after the whole thing starts so they're trying to get people to say oh i want to come for the beginning you know, in years past, I would sometimes go for the Colossus at the beginning, stay to the Millionaire Maker, then go home, or, or actually I used to do a gig in Chicago, kind of right in the middle of June every year, it would time out perfectly because it would just mean I would have to miss the seniors event, which I wasn't eligible for, and I'm still not, but I'm getting pretty close. <laughs> a few more years, I'll be there, buddy. And uh, well, not the super senior, but you know, yeah. I'll, I'll be 50 and not not too much longer. Um, and that's how old you have to be to play the seniors event. But you know, I wasn't eligible for the seniors event or the ladies event, so that would always coincide with my gig in Chicago, which would be perfect. Um, but yeah, I think my thing in this year is I'll probably stay for the whole thing. Um, I'm hoping to be doing some commentary. Uh, that's a little bit up in the air as far as how much live streaming we're going to be doing. 
uh, if they are doing lots of live streaming, how much of that they actually want me to be involved in. <laughs> uh, you know, I think they like me. They usually hire me to do it, so uh, we'll see. But, yeah, there's no announcement about all that yet. We have some time. It's only June. Sure. But, yeah, if I'm there and I'm on the days where I'm not playing, I might be in the booth with uh with hopefully david tuckman who t in my opinion is the best who ever lived at doing that job go um yeah so that's what i'm hoping for but if not if i just had to pick like a week or two i don't know i'd probably go at the beginning and get in that reunion <laughs> thing because that's going to be wild <laughs> yeah i mean it's definitely going to be uh, that'll probably be the the softest tournament i would think of the series um, although many people argue the main is the softest of them all, but who knows? Yeah, the main is pretty awesome. Um, the other one that's kind of interesting, yeah. and I, I know I've seen some chatter about it on Twitter, is this flip and go tournament. Yeah, yeah. So tell people about the flip and go because I tried to explain it last week. I'm not sure I did a great job, but what is your understanding of the flip and go? So it sounds like you, you know, you buy in. Everybody sits down, and they the first hand is essentially everyone's all in um but you're not playing hold'em you're playing pineapple which i don't know how to play but it sounds like you basically get three cards and then you discard one but okay. nonetheless nonetheless it's a flip -a mint for the first hand right so you instantly go from i guess if it's a nine-handed table you, or it's probably ten-handed table even you probably go from ten to one <laughs> and then they just put everybody back together and then they play a regular no limit hold'em tournament and from that point you're in the money yeah Similar to a shootout, right? So if you if you win your first table at, the, at a shootout tournament, you're in the money, right? And so that and then after that, it, it would just be like a normal tournament. But yeah, I think that should be a great event because people are going to win their first table in a flip and go, who otherwise would have very little chance of winning that first table. <laughs> That's going to be true, yeah. Right, and so then you end up in the money deep in a tournament with players who would normally have. A, a, chances are slim and none that they would actually be there at that point in the tournament if it had been just a regular, normal, uh, you know, one thousand dollar buy-in WSOP bracelet event. Right. So I think that's pretty cool. The thing that could be interesting about it now, I need to see the structure because, you know, everybody starts with twenty thousand ships in this tournament. That means yeah. that when once you the flippament's over, now everybody has a ten x starting stack at their next table. So I don't know if they adjust the blinds up, you know. So right, if you started playing like four hundred blinds, right? Yeah. Are you starting? You know, like say it's fifty, a hundred to start, and you start with twenty k chips. Well, now all of a sudden you have two hundred thousand chips, and you're still at fifty one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> it could be an absolute like deep stack, like cash oh, extravaganza. Yeah. I hope that they thought about this. They <laughs> must have, right? They must I, have thought about this. You know, I would assume so, but I've seen odder things done, so it's hard to say. But yeah. either way, it's going to be pretty fun. Like it, it would be the tournament. Like if if you're you know if you're staying with six or seven guys in a house and they're all going to play it, that's the one to go hang out with your buddies for. You know, because everyone's either going to bust and go to the bar, or somebody's going to be in the money and you got somebody to sweat instantly. So it's like the, it's the perfect sweat tournament. Yeah, you bring up a good point. That's true. Either way, it'll be a good time. Yeah, I really like the way you look at that. Yeah, if nothing else, you know, say you and Mark and Carlos and I all decide to enter that thing. You know, odds are, maybe if we're lucky, one of us will make it into the money and win our stupid pineapple flip, <laughs> yeah. and the other guy, the others can go grab a beer and, and watch and cheer. And it's probably also, a, it's probably a great tournament to swap action in. Yeah, for sure, because I, and you know, you guys out there know that I love adding a little bit more luck to the game. <laughs> yeah, you know? and that might just be because I'm a fish and we fish love luck. But listen, I mean. It's more attractive. Now, in this day and age of some players basically being computers who have memorized every spot in GTO and they just, you know, they play like robots and they're unbeatable, uh, we need to find ways to make tournaments more more fun, you know? Yeah. Like the mystery bounty, that's what I love about that. It's like all, all I have to do is bust one player and I might win a quarter million dollars. Yep. I hope they figure out a way to do that. They were planning to do it last year. I saw an interview somewhere with Matt Stout. I believe it was on uh, Matt Stout with Matt Savage on uh, Poker News, and and he was talking about why they did that. Actually, it might not even have been Matt Savage. I saw who is the WSOP tournament director. I'm sure like half the listeners are like yelling at their oh. devices right now, telling me the answer. It's not Matt Savage. No, I'm it's thinking not. of. 
you know, he's WPT. Uh, it's um, uh, his name's on the tip of my tongue, and as soon as we stop recording, it will occur to me. Um, but yeah, you guys all know who I'm talking about. He's the guy in the suit. Every time there's like a controversy on ESPN, you see him there with his suit trying to settle it. <laughs> Jack <laughs> Effel. Jack Effel, thank you. Yeah, Whew. so I saw uh, a conversation with with him. Uh, I believe it was on Poker News, and he was talking about uh, how they realized after the fact that logistically that tournament was going to be pretty hard to manage. So until they figure out a way, they still like the idea, but they're just not sure about implementing it this year and the first year back. So I see. I'm still going to hold out hope that at some point in my lifetime I'll get to play in the Mystery Bounty <laughs> event, which so far has never happened. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they were planning it last year, but they're not planning it this year. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at this schedule here, like towards the end, and yeah, things do get juicy. Now, several years ago, they finally wised up and realized that you should put some stuff after the main event. It used to be the main event was it. You know, that was the last tournament of the summer, and most players they would even reschedule their flights as soon as they bust the main event. They're going home. Yep. Well, now with the main event starting on November 4th, after that you've got the little one for one drop, which every year. Uh, raises all that money for you know really good cause getting clean water around the world so uh the, you know the rake from that tournament goes to the one drop foundation then you got the crazy eights which is one of my favorite tournaments it's an 888 dollar buy-in with an 888 thousand eight hundred eighty-eight dollar guarantee <laughs> for first pl- prize so it's basically like a cheaper millionaire maker uh, then you got a uh, No Limit Hold'em slash PLO event, which I'm definitely going to play if I'm not still in the main. That's on Friday, November 12th. Uh, and you know other stuff. There's a mixed big big bet event. There's a another thing they're doing that's a little bit fun uh, and different is a lot more tournaments are actual freeze outs this year with no I re-entries. Notice that. Yeah, particularly it seems like later in the series. Which I, I think is kind of good for the rec players, you know. I think they kind of like to know that everyone's not just, like, firing 10 bullets to get a stack in these things. That it, you know, And I, know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think some people, like, you know, think that's, like, an unfair advantage, which um, that's an argument for a different podcast. But um, I like having some more freeze-outs in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that freeze-outs kind of look bad. Like, in the old days, they used to do rebuys and add-ons. And, you know, if you're playing a thousand dollar tournament with unlimited rebuys for the first three hours or whatever it used to be, and then you have to pay another thousand, like you need to be bankrolled for that tournament. Realistically, you need to have 15K just to play that tournament correctly, right. you know, because during the rebuy and add on period, you need to be, you know, taking the spots. And if you're, if you're a recreational player and you just have enough for like one rebuy and one add on, so you bring three thousand dollars, which is probably one of the biggest buy-ins you'll ever do. And then you got, you know, three pros at your table that are just kind of going off, happy to take coin flips, especially back then the rebuys and the add-on were not raked at all. So it's basically just, you know, free money in the in the prize pool. Uh, and then you might feel like, well, these guys are taking a lot more chances than I can afford to take. And so they're basically buying a bracelet. Right. And that's when they stopped doing rebuy tournaments where well, they don't have those anymore in the WSOP, but they replaced them with these re-entry events that sometimes you could re-enter on day two at the beginning of day two, which kind of defeated the purpose of getting rid of the rebuys in the first place, except that it was a big cash cow for the WSOP because if they're raking each and every buy-in, it, you know, that's a lot of money that adds up with especially a, a tournament like the uh, Colossus with just unlimited re-entries and they're taking 12 percent of every 400 dollars or whatever it was some crazy amount yeah so yeah I'm, I'm glad to see that they're doing more freeze outs and they seem to be listening to what the uh, recreational players that they're targeting with some of these lower buy-in events are actually saying that they want so hopefully those players will support the tournament in the fall some people think that it's going to be more pro heavy in the fall and that recreational players only have summers off but I, I don't think that's true. Yeah, I don't think so either. Particularly with like the number of people who, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I know like many of my friends 
are still just working at home and are going to be for a very long time. So they kind of have that flexibility to be able to travel and do some work from wherever they might be going, in this case, Vegas. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it hurting the numbers. Um, if anything, it doesn't necessarily help it, but I don't think it hurts it. You bring up a good point, KB. I wonder how many players at my first table of the reunion <laughs> are going to be working from home at the poker table. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will be, so if I'm at your table. (laughs) Why should I take a day off? All I have to do is check my email a few times in between hands. Exactly. I love it. That's awesome. That'll be me. Yeah. Work from home is the best thing to come out of the whole pandemic, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing it for a decade and a half, but uh, I, I mean, now, now everybody's like, wow, you were right, KB. This is really great. But yeah, I do know, I do know a couple of people are like, I can't wait to get back to the office. But most of them have small children, and they're just going insane. So, Yeah, people with small children can't accomplish anything if they work from home. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just how it is. Um, I'm looking at the remainder of the schedule after the main event starts. Uh, you've got your Super Turbo Bounty, No Limit Hold'em Freeze Out, which is on uh, Monday, November 15th. It's a $10,000 buy-in where every player is a 3K bounty. So that, I mean, that's a pretty high-stakes bounty event. But if you like bounties like I do, that, that, that could be fun. Uh, also, the uh, Poker Hall of Fame Bounty, No Limit Hold'em, on November 17th is a uh, $1,979 buy-in where every Hall of Famer, every Poker Hall of Fame member that's in the tournament is going to be a bounty. And rumor has it that some sponsor is going to pay for all of those players' buy-ins so that we can have as many living Hall of Fame members (laughs) in the tournament. If somebody's paying for them to play, why not, right? Absolutely. That's another one that I think is, is super cool for them to do from a marketing standpoint. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily get as excited as I used to when I see, you know, a quote-unquote famous poker player, but I know I did when I first went out to the World Series, you know, a decade and a half ago or whatever. Like, I, I you know, I thought it was so cool when I got to play with TJ Cloutier. So I think giving people an opportunity to play in a tournament where they, they know there's probably going to be a lot of famous players in it, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, one thing somebody told me before I ever went to play in the World Series of Poker is, uh, do not lend TJ Cloutier twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done it too if he had asked me. I definitely would have gave it to him. Yeah, apparently he owes everyone in Vegas twenty dollars. <laughs> <So laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could just give it to him and be like, "Look, Tej, I know I'm never going to see this money again, but you were one of the first players that we ever really saw, kind of highlighted on." the espn broadcast so yeah. here's 20 bucks for entertaining me <laughs> i want to be part of history owe me 20 dollars. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i want to be one of the <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people that have given you 20 dollars and never seen it again <laughs> well it looks good man i mean I, i'm excited to play i'm excited to play next month i'm excited to play in the fall and just get back into live poker now maybe i should talk to you offline about joining you at Cherokee. I've always heard that's a really soft event. I've never gone. Oh yeah, it's a fantastic series. It's uh I believe still the biggest of the circuit events um in terms of turnout. Um and I assume that'll be true this time as well. Um and it's a great it's just a great place to go. It's a little tricky to travel to because it is literally in the middle of nowhere. There's no um, airport, right? You got to like fly and then drive for a couple hours. And yeah, everything. exactly. But it's just a beautiful place to play poker because when you're not playing you're generally outside in like you know the blue ridge mountains you know beautiful mountains and waterfalls and um it's a good time yeah that sounds good a little close to nature instead of this concrete jungle that i'm usually in exactly that sounds fun yeah Yeah, and i think we're i think we're trying to get a group together to rent a cabin out there so um you could always crash with us that'd be fun yeah let's talk maybe i'll do that maybe i'll do that at least for the main event or something out there because cool. I still don't have my circuit ring. That's right. <laughs> First the ring, then the bracelet. You remember that whole? Uh, <laughs> well, don't worry. They're, they're giving the rings away now. So. Yeah, they're. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they might every... be giving them away, but they haven't given me one yet. <laughs> Won't be so long. I have faith. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, all right, cool. So that's the schedule. 
you know, you got your one drop, you got your crazy eights, you got bounties. There's a bounty PLO event on November 11th. That looks like fun. Um, anything else we didn't uh, touch on yet? What's the 50 stack? What the heck is that? 50 stack is 50,000 starting chips for a $1,500 buy-in. So I guess that's uh, a little bigger than usual. It's probably, it's probably one of those misleading ones where they give you 50K, but they start the blinds at 200, 400 instead of 100, oh, 200. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> it's not going to be a good structure. It's just going to start off. The first 20 minutes will be a good structure. After yeah. that, forget it. <laughs> yeah. It's a turbo. I noticed the word turbo is not actually appearing on the schedule. If it is, it's not, it's not on here a lot. There used to be several events that were labeled turbos. I guess they've gotten away from that word. I wonder why that is. Maybe... The feedback was, oh, here's Super Turbo Bounty. That's a one-day event. Yeah, on, I was going to say, uh, I did see a Super Turbo, but you're right. I don't, see any, I don't see the mention of the word Turbo anywhere, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's either a regular tournament or it's a Super Turbo. There's no just Turbo. Somebody I must have decided or, or determined that putting Turbo on there makes people not want to play it. Yeah. I mean, they Pros, I'm sure, want research, to. Like, but... Yeah, of course. Yeah. But they do. They do tons of research. Um, just trying to figure out what what buttons to press to get more people to play. So I saw Lance Bradley trying to take action on over ten thousand players for the main event. So wow. uh, I mean, I, at least some of the people that are kind of close to the poker community are anticipating a very successful WSOP this year. The thing I still don't have my head totally wrapped around is um, international travel. I just haven't been following sort of the news on that front. I don't know what countries are, are preventing people from traveling right now, if any. Maybe they're not. Um, but that will be a, a big deciding factor, obviously. And then, Yeah, no, there um, are still plenty of countries that are really struggling with COVID. I mean, just because yeah. it's, you know, it seems to be pretty well at hand, at least for the moment here in the States. Uh, yeah, who knows if it's coming back or not? It feels like it's ending, but you know I, it ain't over till it's over, right? I mean, this thing could break out again, and who knows? Yeah. Um, I mean, but, I still yeah. have friends even in Canada, which you know, you don't necessarily think of as, you know, the, this faraway land that can't get the vaccine or whatever, but they haven't been able to get it yet. So yeah, there's, there's... plenty of countries where they didn't they didn't get the vaccine yet, or it's very hard to get. You know, I remember when it first started. In New York, they were like, if you're over 65 or if you're a, a an essential worker, mm. you can get it. Now there's like a place down the street for me where you can literally just walk in and get it like without an appointment. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody just walk in and be like, behind hey, the I'm Waffle House. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the big convention center in New York. The Javits Center is in my neighborhood where I live, and uh, yeah, it's it's just this gigantic building with all of these people in there with needles filled with uh, vaccines so then just wait all day for people to come in and they can <laughs> stick needles in their arms so uh it's a great time to be alive in america but meanwhile there are countries like india and other places especially in southeast asia where they're just really they don't have access to the vaccine at all yeah so i guess that's american privilege and we should be grateful that we live in this country even though uh you know we can't so play a lot of people give us a bad rap <laughs> not everything about america sucks apparently <laughs> and the other factor is uh, you know we, we kind of referenced it a little bit earlier maybe half joking but i'm not joking crypto like i mean if bitcoin goes to 15k there'll be less people in the main event than if it goes to 75k by september so we'll yeah right yeah just for reference um not that long ago maybe like 12 or 14 months ago Bitcoin was at 8,000 and it went all the way up to 64,000. And then just recently in the last week, it went all the way down to like 29,000. So uh, for those who are heavily invested in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, it has been a wild <laughs> ride to say the least. <laughs> I've aged 20 years just from watching my crypto accounts the last couple months. All right. So yeah, you, you, your wallet's full, <laughs> but not as full as it used to be. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, do you have a hand we can discuss? Because I could literally talk about how fantasizing about getting to the Rio all day, but I know the listeners are probably sick of hearing about it, and they want to hear us talk poker. Yeah, especially the ones that can't go. They're like, keep rubbing it in, guys. It's cool. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any listeners in countries that don't have vaccines yet, apologies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes, I do have a hand, um, and I apologize for not knowing uh, what tournament this is from. That's okay. Um, we're used to it by yeah, now. Yeah, you know, mid stakes ACR 
tournament. Yeah, basically, it's always the usual the grind, group. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I believe we're in the money because the blinds are quite big at fifteen thousand, thirty thousand. Uh, so we're probably in the money at this point in the tournament. Um, and we are sitting with seventy-seven big blinds. Uh, so we have two point two five million at thirty thousand big blind, uh, and we are actually in the big blind. Okay. Uh, so it folds around to under the gun plus two, uh, who makes it sixty uh, k. So a straight min raise. He's opening off of forty one big blinds, and then the button calls. Uh, he has eighty three big blinds behind, and and now it's on us. Uh, so it's you know, a min raise. So thirty one one big blind to call. We have seventy seven big blinds, and we have the king of diamonds and the queen of hearts. Um, so I was going to skip just right to the flop, but I wanted to ask you first. I was thinking about this hand when I was when I was looking at it before the podcast. If I looked at my HUD, I would bet that I three bet king queen offsuit about five percent of the time, or something like that when it's when it's raised and then folds to me. I'm wondering how often you're three betting in a spot like this because I never do. Yeah, I mean it's uh. It's not a bad hand to do it with. Uh, to be honest, I probably would call like 100% of the time unless I really felt like the original Razor is just a wild – because he's coming in from early position. You said third position? Yeah. Second? Yeah. So, I mean, that's not a late position. Like I would be much more likely to just you know three-bet it versus a button steal. Um, yeah. But, yeah, given that it's gone raise from early and then call on the button – I would probably always want to call here, especially against these stacks. Um, but yeah, in, in other situations, I would definitely put that hand into a three betting range. And the reason why is because you block a lot of the hands that you really don't want to be up against, like ace king, ace queen, king king, and queen queen. Those yep. are kind of the main ones. Um, having a king and a queen in your hand makes this a relatively attractive three betting candidate. But to me, that's counterbalanced by the fact that the open is from early position. So, uh, yeah, for that reason only, I mean, unless you tell me this original Razor is a a maniac, I'm not going to consider three betting here, but I'm happy to call. Cool. Yeah. And for reference, he is pretty snug. Um, You know, I'd I'd call him tag. He's running 18, 14. So, you know, he's not as nitty as me, but he's not, uh, you know. He's not in that sort yeah, of like twenty four seventeen range that you see a little like slightly more aggressive regulars at. Yeah. By the way, those are my exact numbers over sixty five thousand hands. Twenty four seventeen. I knew that. That's why I was using it as reference. Yeah, it's incredible. You just because I was just looking at that today because it's been a while since we went over my HUD stats. We had that whole episode a while back where I went over uh, like my HUD stats, not really understanding them fully. Not that I understand them fully now, but I understand them a lot better than I used to. Um, but Snost, uh, Jason Smith, and I did a whole podcast where we kind of like dissected the HUD stats. I remember that, yeah. And yeah, that's that's where I come in for 24-17. So that's great. interesting. <laughs> All right, so uh, this guy is not like that. He's he's a – and especially I would assume from early position, he's probably even tighter than that 17%, 18% open. Yeah, so, so. Yeah, he's going to have a, a mostly value-heavy range here, maybe the occasional suited connector or suited ace mixed in, but mostly it's going to be value. Yep. So that, that makes it less attractive to three-bet him here. Cool. All right, so we do just call, uh, which uh, takes us to a flop with 231,000 chips in the middle. Uh, and again, we have the king of diamonds, queen of hearts. Flop comes 9-10 jack, two clubs. Okay. Pretty good flop for us, uh, yeah. giving us the uh, stone nuts as of now. Yeah, I mean, definitely above average flop. Uh, <laughs> it's the classic always... w- when you're playing live, somebody says, at what point did you like the flop? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> when did you like the hand? Yeah. Um, you know, I do lead here sometimes because I want to be able to lead when I have like a combo draw or just uh, you know just a bare flush draw with like ace deuce of clubs or something. Um, so because of that, I want to also lead. So those would be my bluffs, my semi bluffs, um, or possibly like if I had a hand like queen ten, mm-hmm. right? So you've got like a open ender with the second pair. Like I would sometimes want to lead with a hand like that. Um, so for that reason, I would just lead here uh, at least some of the time. You want to mix it up, 
don't always lead when you have the nuts, but against two opponents, there's just a good chance you're going to get action. So, yeah, I was going to say this deep um, against two opponents on this particular board, like it's pretty hard not to have something, you know. Yeah, it's, unless it's, it's unless you know they have like fives and fours or something, like it's pretty tough for them not to at least be in the vicinity of this flop. Yeah, and most people don't put the. Uh, their donk leading range usually doesn't include the absolute stone called nuts, so that for that reason it's good to have it in yours. Um, you know, similarly, I might lead with a set here as well, so I definitely have a lot of value in my leading range because I want to always. I shouldn't say always. I, I say always and never too often. I realize that <laughs> listening to previous Especially episodes, poker. But, yeah, I mean these aren't words we should be using, but you do want to do it a lot um, with the flush draw. Because you want to be able to do it with with the nuts as well, so yeah, um, or or close to it. Like if I had, if I had just flat it with pocket nines, and it comes jack ten nine with two clubs, I'm I love to lead, you know, because they mm. usually put you on that flush draw. Right. So you want to be able to be a, beat a flush draw sometimes, and also, um, you, it does help you protect your hand, which you really don't want to see when you flop a set, or even the straight here is for it to check around and then another club comes off. Yeah. You know that's that's pretty brutal. Out of position, you know they might be able to bluff you off of of the straight, especially if it comes club club. So I'd rather be the one just like taking the lead all of a sudden because a lot of times when you donk lead, uh, most people always check to the razor or check to the razor way too often at least. So when you donk lead out, a lot of players are really kind of they're back on their heels like well what does this mean right and so anytime my opponent's thinking what does this mean that's a good thing for me so yeah i would go ahead and bet and bet pretty big here like uh maybe two-thirds of the pot and see what happens i like that a lot better in hindsight um i did not do that unfortunately i went ahead and checked uh hoping that our uh original razor would go ahead and continue on this flop he has a very low c bet percentage which i think is even more reason that i should probably just lead because it seems like he just c bets when he connects and doesn't when he doesn't. Um, but either way, we decide to check, and it actually checks around, uh, much, okay. much to our dismay. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. I, mean, I, I understand what you're saying about him not c betting, but he's going to have a lot of value. I mean, he's going to want to protect when he has pocket kings, pocket aces, mm -hmm. ace jack. You know, just because he doesn't bet this time, and he normally doesn't semi bluff especially two opponents he doesn't i should say c bet bluff uh you know very few players that are this tight are going to run like a, elaborate continuation bet type of bluffs on a board like this that's so wet and hits so many of their opponent's hands um you know he's probably going to have like a lot of value in his betting range on the flop which is basically what you said like he doesn't really see bet maybe heads up he might see bet a little more often than that but on this board, like, do, do you ever see bet on Jack Ten Nine with two clubs when you don't have anything? Because I sure don't. <laughs> yeah, good point. You know, that's just not a board. That's not a good board for a C bet. So when yeah. he does bet on the flop, it's usually going to be with a hand like pocket aces, pocket kings, or in a dream scenario, a set of jacks would just be so brilliant because you can get all the chips yeah. when he has that. He, he really can't fold that no matter what you do. So, yeah, and I, I always make this joke too, like when I have aces and I get called by two players, like the flop you don't want to see is nine ten jack. <laughs> it's just like cool. How how am I going to lose this hand on the flop turn at river? <laughs> yeah, it's just not a good board for one pair. Um, but still, he's going to want to protect his one pair hand, and he would absolutely want to bet. He would assume for value uh, when he has a, a really strong hand like a set. And also the caller on the button could easily have jack ten, mm -hmm. um, or other hands that might want to bet this flop. So I, you know, to be clear, I don't hate checking. I just like to bet so much on boards like this when I'm the big blind. So I need to bet them sometimes when I actually have something. Yeah. So that's why I would lead here. If you never lead with your bluffs, then you shouldn't be leading with the nuts either. That makes sense. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so uh, again, it checked around, so we still have 231,000 chips in the pot. And the turn is the Queen of Clubs. <laughs> Can so, you think of a worse card? I know no. I can't. It is I the worst card. That's the worst in the deck. card. Yeah, that is the absolute worst <laughs> card I can think of right now. So now the Ace King got there and has us beat. The Flush got there, obviously. Uh, oh, man, that's, that is ugly. But, you know, all is not lost, Eric. 
Yeah, we still got the straight. We still have a straight, which is a very strong hand regardless. Um, Also, no one bet the flop. And if they had a flush draw, either of your opponents probably would have bet the flop at least some of the time. So the flush doesn't scare me that much. I'm more worried about the original Razor having ace-king because he's probably got a tight range from up front in the first place. And then when he doesn't bet the flop, he doesn't have a set. He doesn't have... You know, he's either got ace queen, ace king a lot. Uh, maybe he could have like pocket eights. I don't know. Yeah, I guess pocket sevens, pocket eights. He's probably folding sixes from that position mm-hmm. if he's that tight, right? So he, it's just hard to put him on a hand um, that we want him to have right now. Right. So uh, even though we have a straight, it's it's not great that that queen came off. And now, even if they don't have a flush, which they probably don't, because again, they didn't semi bluff the flop. Uh, they at least have a flush draw a lot now, mm-hmm. so we're vulnerable either way. Yeah. So with that in mind, do we want to lead here? I guess. Uh, I guess checking again has its merits, but I think leading here is a little bit stronger because again, I think it's unlikely uh, that we're going to be up against a flush right now because no one bet the flop. Um, not to say that players always semi bluff the flop. But certainly the original Razor, like if he had a hand like Ace King of Clubs, he's got like a straight flush draw or something. Mm-hmm. Royal flush draw, like you bet that hand. I don't, I don't care who you are, you bet that hand. Yeah. Right. I would agree. And the, the guy in position just saw two checks. And he, you know, if he's got something like you know seven six of clubs, he's gonna put a bet out there, right? Like of course he will. So at least some of the time. Now some players will get tricky and and check it or whatever but uh i'm not that afraid of the flush right now i'm just afraid of another club coming off and i'm really afraid of ace king mm-hmm. but, I think, yeah, but I'm still the same way yeah but still there's so many hands right there's so many hands um i think we can we can bet and get value from those flush draw type hands mm-hmm. like the original razor has like ace queen with the ace of clubs hands like that they have to pay off yeah i think it's especially being up against two opponents like I like leading here because I, I kind of want to tax the ace of clubs X hand, you know, whether it's ace jack, ace 10, ace queen, you know, all those hands with the ace of clubs. They're not going away, I don't think, and I'd rather just go ahead and tax them now. Yeah, the only problem is we're getting free rolled by king X where one of the two cards is a club. And That's I hate true, that. yeah. yeah. I hate that a lot, but, uh, you know, you can't worry about everything, and there are a lot of hands, so... I mean, you can get value from worse straights, right? When someone has the bottom end, he might pay you off once, especially if he has a club with it. Um, some players might even call with two pair. But I think it calls for kind of a smallish bet. Like where I wanted to bet two-thirds on the flop, at this point, I think I'd rather bet like one-third of the pot, offering four to one, knowing that we're never going to pay off if another club comes off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like a smaller sizing too, and and so spoiler, I did decide to lead here, and cool. I did go smaller, but I don't think I went as small as I'd like. I went one hundred one, um, which is a little less than half. How much did you say was in there? Two uh, two thirty one. Two thirty one. So you bet one hundred one. Okay. Yeah, um, I would go a little bit smaller than that, but I don't hate it. Like that's fine. Yeah. I think, but yeah, it's an it's a somewhat of a negligible difference, but I think somewhere around like ninety would be cool or eighty. Uh, I'd be cool in that range for a for yeah. bet, but it's it's not a huge deal. But you know, small small mistakes add up over time, so <laughs> it could get yeah. worse eventually. But um, yeah. I'm, but I, I do like the lead here though, so I, I'm at least happy I chose to lead and not just kind of keep taking the sort of. Because it, it would be easy to, to love this flop and then just, like, get scared on this turn and, and just, like, not bet. So, I, I don't know. I'm happy I bet. Um, yeah, I'm happy you bet, too. I think I think betting is better than checking. I mean, why give them a free club, you know? Yeah. So, we like I said, we bet 101. Actually, 101.640, to be exact. And the original Razor calls. And then the uh, button folds. Okay. So now there is 434,000 in the middle. What do you make of this call? I mean, he's got a straight every time, right? Yeah, I think we're probably... Yeah, I think he has a king a lot of the time. Uh, And when he doesn't, I think he has a lot of those hands we were kind of just talking about, like the ace-queen with the ace of clubs kinds of hands. 
Yeah. Um, it, you're right. It really sucks when he has the king. It, it's almost worse when he has the king of clubs than the ace of clubs. Well, it's actually <laughs> yeah. way worse. Um, it's way worse because then yeah. he, we're just we're, we're getting free rolled. We're chopping or we're losing. Yeah. Yeah. So th- that's kind of what, like I think we can pretty much eliminate the one the one thing that like we're kind of ahead of I guess is like an eight, but I just don't know that he has many of those. Um, no, I don't. Like, I, with like, another player yet to act, and the flush coming in, like you're the really only one that's likely to have a flush. Not that you're likely to have a flush, but you're more likely than the other two because mm-hmm. they neglected to bet the flop with the flush draw that they probably don't have. But you could easily have a flush draw on this flop, and we're looking to check raise it on the flop, right? Yeah. I mean, it could also be. I mean, you mentioned Ace King earlier. It could be like Ace King uh, without a club. And now he's just kind of sort of trying to pot control in case I do have that flush, so he's just calling. I think that's yeah. also a possibility. Yeah, um, you're definitely more likely to have a flush than he is, and he can't really get value. If he has ace-king, it's hard for him to get value from worse, actually. I mean, if he raised if if he raised you here, wouldn't you just fold? Depending on the sizing, but I think I probably have. I mean, like, if he just clicks it back or something, I guess I'm probably calling. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, if he wants to milk us for, like, the minimum. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Which I hate when they do that. Because <laughs> I, I always fall for it. I'm always like, sure, here. Um, but, yeah, to any, like, normal size raise, I mean, I think we just have to fool. Because we're, we're just praying that we're chopping. Like, yeah, we're, we're calling the raise to hope we're chopping and... Obviously, a pretty good percentage of that time are not. We're losing, so yeah, or at least getting free rolled by a chop. Like if he has pocket kings with the king of clubs, right? Yeah, I, I think that hand would probably have bet the flop, but maybe not. You know, it's also hard for him to have that exact hand because we already have a king. Yeah, but it's possible. Obviously, yeah. it's possible. So, mm-hmm. all right. So yeah, so four hundred thirty-four thousand in the middle, and we see a river of the jack of spades. Pairing the board just to make things even more complicated. So now we have Jack, Jack, 10 9 Queen, and the 10 9 Queen are of clubs. So I guess it's, you know, it's worth mentioning that King Jack of clubs is a straight flush. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so things even got worse. We are first act, again, 434,000 in the middle, and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. <laughs> I mean, I would usually check fold, but. Like, fancy play, Clayton wants to, like, check raise really big, you know. That would be sexy. Because if, if you check and he bets with, uh, you know, ace-king and you check raise it, I mean, he's just in hell. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're really going to put this guy through the ring. Like, he's got to try to get value from ace-king if you check it. Like, nobody checks behind with ace-king just because the board paired. Right. You know, you have shown... Yeah, you know, it just doesn't feel like you have a flush at all, like ever, the way you've played the hand, yeah. right? Yeah. So he's not worried about the flush, and he shouldn't be too worried about the board pairing, at least not worried enough to not try to squeeze a little value out of Ace King. But you know, when you check raise big here, I, he probably just has to fold it. Yeah, um, I didn't even kind of consider that as an option. I was originally kind of thinking we had two options. Uh, I thought bet betting smallish and then just folding to a raise, or just check calling, or you could check fold too, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think my 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 default play here would be to check fold, especially against a player like this. Like you said, he's got like an eighteen percent um, pre flop, or, or did you say seventeen, eighteen yeah, percent pre flop? Yeah, and then uh, you know V pip, and then he he doesn't really do a whole lot of betting and c betting and, and stuff like that so like you know players like him they're, they're just not like gonna he's gonna be happy to chop it with you when he just has a straight a king mm-hmm. you know but when he's got the broadway he's got to try to get value from hands like a king or if you somehow have three jacks or whatever you know he's got to try to get value with ace king ace king is too good to check behind and not good enough to call a check raise so it feels like a great spot for like a really sexy check raise bluff on the river. But that said, my default is still just to check fold. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to check and call. I don't want to do that. 
Yeah, I think maybe against a. I mean, I don't want to not. I don't want to say this guy's not a thinking player because I know nothing about him other than his numbers. I don't recall how he was playing or anything. I think against like a known thinking player, I think check raise is pretty sexy. It's not something I would almost ever think to do, but in you know, with the the benefit of hindsight, it is pretty sexy because he pretty much has to have. He pretty much has to have a full house to like call a, a big check raise. Yeah, and and we do block a few of those, right? Yep. No. Wait, yeah, do we? Because we, we, well, we have the queens. We have so we a block queen. queens. Yeah, so we block some full houses, right? Um, which is nice, but also just the way the hand has played out, it doesn't feel like he has much besides like ace king. Mm-hmm. Like all these other hands, like it, all of his full houses, all of his hands that are now full houses probably should have bet the flop. Yeah. So the yeah. the fact that when he bets the river, it's going to be ace king so often, and even in the rare occasion that it's a flush, he can't call. Right. I mean, he'll call sometimes with the flush. He'll never call with the Broadway straight. He'll sometimes call with the flush. I'm talking about a big check raise here, like whatever he puts in, put in like four or five times as much. Yeah, which would essentially yeah. be putting him all in because I mean, there's four four thirty in there. So if he bets two, he has eight hundred. He, if he does 200k, he has 800k behind. So we probably oh, just put them all in. He's the guy who started with 40 blinds. Correct. Oh, I had him confused with the button. Yeah, no, I like it even better now. Yeah, check shove. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm sorry. I thought that our opponent had us covered. All no, right, no, under those circumstances, I think I would check shove most of the time here. Mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, that's know. that's pretty sexy. I I never even considered it as an option. Even in hindsight, <laughs> when I was thinking about it, I'm like, well, how are we are we folding now or are we folding later? Dude, the whole reason I turn on my computer is to find the check raise bluff on the river. <laughs> I'm uh, just I'm looking to check raise bluff one river a night just to just you know go to sleep with a smile on my face. <laughs> Whether it works or not, it just feels good. It's yeah. just it's a play that is very underutilized in the world. So. Well, I wish I had used it, I think, because I end up checking, and he bets 147k into 434k. Yeah, I'm all in. Yeah, I like that. I actually, I like, so this is the order of, of things I like in this in this spot in this hand. I like shoving, better than folding, better than calling. <laughs> in other words, folding is better than calling here, I think, and shoving yeah, is better we than can't both. Call. Um, so yeah. you guys, listeners, can probably guess what I did. I called <laughs> and handed the guy another 147,000 chips as he turns over uh, the ace king. Yeah, ace no king. Club. No club. Okay. Yeah, so he can't beat anything when you shove except for that bluff. Yeah. And it almost feels like he's making a bet that he can fold to the shove. Like, like yeah, he's, he bet he, pretty he, small he, here. On yeah, the he's like yeah, going he's... for thin value. I think maybe thinking like, well... I'm going to have to fold if this guy shoves, but I'm going to try to get a little thin value here. Yeah, and that's how all of us would play ace-king in his shoes. Like, if I'm that player and I make my straight on the turn and then the board pairs on the river, but the guy checks to me, I'm like, oh, I, I can't just check back. I'm I, I'm not this much of a nit. I have the ace-high straight, and, and my opponent will sometimes have three jacks or the king-high straight. Yeah. I just need to bet this hand for value. And hope that he doesn't like shove it on me. I mean, and most players won't ever shove it on. Like you said, you didn't even consider it. You know, so when you see those spots where it's just, you know, you've got a guy who's making a bet that he's basically obligated to make that he absolutely can't call the shove. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also yeah. like he, he hardly ever has the full house himself. Right? That would mean that he flopped a set and checked it back or something? Like Yeah. You know, you know, like on, on two clubs, like on we all board. bet our set. Yeah, on yeah. that board, like you're gonna protect your hand, um, and you don't even mind getting raised. Like if you check raised him, he's like, okay, so maybe Derek has a straight, but I still have outs. You know, by the river, yeah. I'll have ten outs. So yeah. let's go. I'm gonna call that check raise, and I'll play in position for us. Like you're not gonna not bet because you're afraid that someone could have flopped the nuts. Right. Yeah. You know. If he's got a pocket tens and it comes jack ten nine. He's going to bet it a hundred percent of the time, or close to that. So that means that he's extremely unlikely to now have a full house. But you can have a flush. You can have a full house. Not that you would check raise the flush probably. 
Although, knowing that he's mostly betting ace-king, maybe you should. Yeah. And try to get value for it. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, just finding those spots where it's pretty clear what your opponent has. It's hard for me to put him on anything other than ace-king. I said maybe ace-queen, right, with the ace of clubs is a mm-hmm. possibility. But it's it's pretty remote. Yeah. So yeah, it just feels like Ace King a lot, and so because I know that hand can't call the shove, it's like turning my <laughs> turning my second nut straight into a, <laughs> into, a <laughs> into a seven deuce, but you know whatever. I just uh, yeah, that's a spot where I would I would I would hope that he bets that river so that I can shove on him. Yeah, I wish I had done that now because I want to know what he would have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's pretty heroic if he calls you down with Ace King. With the flush out there, with the paired board, yeah, uh, it's pretty heroic on his part. I mean, you you'll get that call sometimes and be like, "Wow, nice hand, dude." Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. You, that, that's when you just look. Yeah, you just you just shake their hand and say, "Nice one." Yeah, I mean that's that's a good hand by him if he can call that, because uh, I know I can't call it. Like in his shoes, I have to bet my ace king, and I have to fold to the check raise all in, and h- just hate life. It's like, darn, like why the board have to pair? Yeah. You know, or maybe he had me on the turn. Maybe Derek made a flush on the turn. Yeah, because I'd probably play that the same way. I think. Yeah. Do we check raise the flush on the on the river with the board paired? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe only, hmm, only the ace high flush. Maybe I don't even know. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, maybe. I, I think we probably do because, as we said, we don't think he ever checks a set. So. Yeah, it's pretty. It it just feels like ace king like so much. Yeah. So maybe check raising with the with the flush is a good play because he might. Yeah, and then you hope he makes that hero call. Yeah. You know, but yeah, it's uh. I think, I think he just he can't call with ace king. <laughs> he just can't. <laughs> I mean, they will some non-zero percent of the time, but it's definitely extremely profitable to do that so it's unusual to turn such a strong hand as a straight into a bluff but in this spot against this opponent who has such a pretty tight opening range it feels to me like he's going to have ace king a vast majority of the time yeah and since his cards are face up i know how to play him yeah yeah i think it's a great spot for it he his bet even leaves him with 30 big blinds behind which is like it almost seems intentional like he's like Oh, I'm still fine if I have to fold this hand. Yeah, no, that's a stack. He's fine. He's got 30 blinds. He can play that. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Rather than just, like, paying off the obvious quads or whatever Derek has, you know? Right. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, I can't beat anything. When you check raise me on this river, the only thing I can beat is a bluff. And what bluffs do you have? Right. Like, this is it. (laughs) And, And... I, yeah, I don't even know if he can put me on this. I think he just has to be like, this is just never a bluff. Like, that's what I'd be saying in his shoes. This is never a bluff. Yeah, I mean, look at your line. You checked It checked around on the flop, which is not that unusual. Then you led the turn and check-raised the river. That is so strong. Yeah. That's and you guy. led pretty big on the turn, too. Like, you know, relative, bigger than I wanted to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. I it's mean, an interesting that's spot. Just the, yeah. This I love is, to find one of those every night. If I play like six or seven tournaments in a night, I'm going to have one check raise bluff yeah. <laughs> that I'll force to happen. <laughs> this is why it's really good too to talk over hands with friends because even reviewing the hand today, check raising the river did not come to my mind. Like doing it by myself. So, uh, for those of you looking for other ways to get better, find some poker buddies, talk hands. Yeah, especially if it's a sicko. Like me, like I live for bluffing. Like that's the whole reason I play poker. Like yeah. I try to find the bluffs. So <laughs> yeah, find somebody who doesn't play like you, or yeah, you know, like you don't want to play with somebody who plays just like you and is the same skill level as you. Like find somebody to talk hands with who's either like a completely different style or better than you. There's never been a time when you brought a hand where I was like, why did Derek bring that hand? <laughs> you know, there's always something cool about the hands you bring. So thanks uh, for delivering that. as. As always. Absolutely. And, uh, before, fun. Yeah, before we go, why don't you... What's happening at our favorite poker site? Yeah, so good stuff. I'm, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, things have been so busy that I am way behind on videos. But uh, there is a uh, brand new series from Andrew Brokus that just started. Um, it's a it's from the uh, OSS series on ACR. 
Um, so for our American viewers or other countries viewers who play on ACR and you want to kind of, you know, look at a hand history review from the particular site you play on, that's a good one. I'm looking forward to it because, of course, that's where I generally play. Uh, and sure. then there's another one which is now on part five that I have been uh, wanting to delve into and have not been able to yet. But it'll be a good one to kind of get ready for the upcoming series, um, which is a, a theory video from Daryl Jace where he talks about hand reading. Um, and I'm assuming that since it's already on part five that it's a pretty in-depth look at hand reading. And uh, I have not done a lot of theory study in probably two years, <laughs> you know, probably since the last time I was getting ready to go to the World Series. So uh, I'm looking forward to deep diving into that as well. Yeah, so important to just like go back and check and and listen to some theory once in a while, you know, especially you like you're streaming all the time on Twitch, which your stream, you know, on your Twitch is so entertaining. It's always fun. Killing Bird. Uh, you got to go check out Killing Bird on Twitch if you're a, a Twitch user. Um, but yeah, you do a lot of practice. And really, the way to get better is through theory and practice. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to go back every so often and just, you know, kind of check some of your ranges and, and just think uh, it maybe theoretically about the game rather than just like we're doing now, like talk about hands and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I spend so much time sort of in the weeds, you know, the, the mechanics of playing. Um, it's been a long time since I've kind of said I'm just thought about the game from a bigger perspective. So. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so that's pretty cool. And and you know, Daryl Jace is just, is such a smart guy too, like such a good poker player. So looking forward oh, yeah. to that. And it'll be a great sort of counter, you know, of of Brokos and Jace sort of theory and a hand history review, and I can kind of soak them all in together. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, when I think about theory of poker, I like to do so like on the top of a mountain, like if you can get yourself. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go up there. Well, maybe I'll do it at Cherokee. Clothes. Yeah, yeah. Go to Cherokee. Go to the top of a mountain. Take off all your clothes and stare at the sun <laughs> as it's setting, and do like a meditation and 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 listen to a, a TP, <laughs> watch a TP video up there. <laughs> if you can get Wi-Fi in North Carolina, I'm not sure what the mountains are like there. Yeah, but, maybe not up there. Uh, yeah, that's the way I do it. I don't know about everybody else, but like that's it. that's the best way. Didn't yeah. even know they had mountains in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a hill in Central Park somewhere. I'll <laughs> look for it later. Well, that's cool, man. Uh, well, you know, Derek, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. As I said, I know how busy you are. And you know, for those who don't know, each and every week I send KB a text and I say, hey, can you podcast with me this week? You know, everybody likes it better when you're on. Uh, as much as they love hearing my voice for an hour, uh, I think they'd rather hear us talk uh, together and have more of a conversational podcast. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, hopefully we can get together in the fall, maybe join the, uh, what is it, the flip and go or the tag team or something. And yeah, there we go. You know, have some, turn this solo experience into a team sport <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> That'll make for some fun po strategy podcasts if we play the tag team together. No doubt. <laughs> it would just be like polar opposites, right? <laughs> So this is where KB tagged in, and we knitted our way down to 10 big blinds. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could call our team the Knit and the Freak. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So check out those new videos on TPE. Uh, guys, if you haven't joined yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. For as little as $25 a month with an annual subscription, you can get access to all the videos that literally thousands of others and you know some of the best minds in the business so uh visit tournamentpokeredge.com so for derek killing bird tenbush and for everyone here at tpe i'm clayton fletcher thank you so much for listening
I'll roll with her, a hot pair we will be. While little gambling is fun when you're with me. Russian roulette is not the same without a gun. And baby, when it's love, it's not rough, it isn't fun.